And I want to kick it off by a talk I also um, did last week at the Kafka Summit in San Francisco. So that's, um, you basically get the second, second run of that, which is normally the better one. Um, so I, I talked about monitoring and orchestration of microservices. Um, and I want to dive into what that means in a, in a, um, in a bit. Um, quick poll. Who is doing microservices here? I would say do microservices. Who is capable of writing Java? Okay, more or less half of the people. Who is using Kafka? Okay, that's probably the other half. Okay, now we, okay, that's good to know. Um, okay, let's, let's do that. So, um, for today, I want to, want to, um, yeah, look into microservices. And I actually, if you don't call the microservice, that's also fine. What I look into are, um, if you want to, um, divide or slice down your architecture into different components. It might be microservices, it might be services functions, it might be whatever you call it. So it just means that you basically break it down into, into independent isolated um, components and then normally they have like an own team caring about that, probably run as an own program in an own programming language on an own server, um, in an own Docker image, whatever it is that you have there and they normally have their own um, Data, data store. That's my definition of microservice here for today. And we recently run a survey as well, so that's available um, on, on our pages in the blog, so you can look that up in, in, in full detail. Um, but we also asked the people, okay, what are you doing with microservices? And we saw that a couple of people already are really doing microservices. Um, most of them are at least considering it. And in the middle, the most of them are, are doing kind of a mixer. They started doing some microservice experiments. So if you do the math and check, okay, who is at least considering microservice, that's quite quite a big percentage. And that's actually also reflecting or reflected in most of the projects. And we see at customers also there. So it's really hard um, to get around um, microservices at all. So that's a kind of thing you should probably also think about it. And if you're going, um, the microservice road, I would, I would call that, then you probably stumble upon um, blog posts like this. Um, who knows Martin Fowler? Just a quick call. Okay. He's a guy from UK. He writes a couple of books and writes blog posts. Um, he's relatively famous. So the things um, he writes are really a good like, resource um, to dive into. And he wrote quite a while back that the microservice community, if you do microservices, then normally you favor an um, approach of so-called smart endpoints and dumb pipes. And that's actually a so-called choreography. I do an example in a minute, then you get a better understanding what, what choreography means. But he basically said, okay, you do that, these smart endpoints, the services, and a dumb pipe, for example, like Kafka, a transport. And then these services are, are kind of communicated in order to get something done. And that's better than using like an orchestrated approach at that time he wrote some using restish protocols. Nowadays, it would be probably also like messaging. So that's quite a while back. And um, what we see actually is that a lot of people um, adopting that idea. Um, I use one example, which is kind of motivated by Salando. Salando is here based in Berlin. You probably know them here in Germany. So um, they're shipping cloth. They're quite big. They did a meetup um, one year back, more or less, um, where they talked about their order fulfillment process and how they do it. And the example I have today is not from Salando, but it's motivated by the story. So you can probably relate that to the idea of what Salando is doing. And they're, they're using these kind of technologies um, in the back. So it's kind of realistic. And if we think of such an order fulfillment, um, yeah, business capability or business process, um, you have probably a couple of services which are um, required in order to get that working. So let's, um, uh, let's imagine you have a checkout service where you can order stuff. So you click a button and say, hey, I want to have that shoe, for example, for Salando. Um, then you probably have inventory where you know what's on stock. You probably have payment because you want to collect money from the customer, obviously. And you have um, shipment because you want to ship that <coughs> in whatever parcels to the customer. And if you're running Kafka, you might want to use Kafka in order to connect these microservices. Familiar? Understandable? I guess. Yeah, right. So that's um, what we have. And if you're looking into the event-driven approach of doing things, and that's actually quite hip at the moment, um, then you could probably implement um, such an, what I would call an end-to-end -end flow, or an end-to-end -end business process, or an end-to-end -end workflow. The wording is kind of overlapping there. Um, you could do something like 
I start by clicking the button, then you probably have to pay for the item, then you fetch it from the inventory and then you ship it to the customer. And you have to do that in, in the right sequence in order to get that going. And if you look at an event driven, it could be that the checkout service emits an event and says, okay, hey, somebody clicked the button, so there's an order placed. And payment um, recognizes, oh, order placed, so I have to retrieve payment. And the next thing it does, it basically retrieves the payment, emits an event, hey, payment was retrieved. Inventory knows, oh, if payment is retrieved, I have to fetch the goods. Um, and the goods are fetched, shipment knows that it has to ship that goods, okay? This is how you could implement this kind of business process in an event-driven way. Would does something like this choreographed? At least a couple of people, okay. Um, the problem with that, and we already saw that actually in a in really a lot of projects emerging is that you um, you lose sight of what you're doing there because the like the real sequence of of what hap what's happening here is not anywhere visible because every service just knows what it listens to and what what it emits so it's hard to see what's really going on there um, I discussed that a couple of times and I was really happy like um, beginning of uh, 2017, so last year, Martin Fowler came up with another blog post. And he said, okay, um, the danger is that it's very easy to make nicely decoupled systems with event notification, the thing I just showed. So that's why we're doing it, um, without realizing that you're losing sight of, sight of a larger scale flow and thus set yourself up for trouble in future years. And that's definitely not where we want to be in future years, right? So um, there is some problem with this kind of choreographed approach with that. Um, we also saw that in the survey, by the way. So if you look at the survey, um, what we saw there is that um, the number top, uh, the top challenge, the top problem that people are facing is the lack of visibility into end-to-end -end business processes, like that span these services. And the second one is also related to that, actually, ambiguous error handling leading to unaddressed errors at the boundaries between microservices. So what we see is that the complexity shifts from the single service, that gets easier to do because it's kind of a, like a microservice, kind of a smaller ecosystem. That's getting easier to do, probably unless you do machine learning in there, but if you do like normal stuff, it's relatively easy. But the complexity moves to the collaboration between these services. And that's what we really um, also see there. If you look at other sources, like for example, Netflix came up with a, with a tool called Conductor, um, it's also open source, um, and they called it a microservice orchestrator. and they pretty much said the same thing. So they said something like, um, traditionally, some of these processes has been orchestrated in a hot manner using combination of pops up, okay? They're doing different technologies, direct rest calls, and so on and so forth, but it's basically choreography. However, as the number of microservices grow and the complexity increases, getting visibility into these distributed workflows become difficult. So they also had the same challenge. And I could pull up like, 10 more slides of different sources from people recognizing this. So it's, people start to learn that there is a kind of a problem there. I always summarize that with this picture because they, um, what I see a lot of people um, using is this picture for choreography. It's kind of a, like a beautiful dance. Everybody knows what, what he has to do and then they, they're dancing and somehow it's really, really cool what you get out there. But what we see in, in like in real product, it's kind of, bit different actually so um, it's still yeah everybody does what what he needs to do but it's it's really hard to understand what's going on and it's it's sometimes impossible to manage it in a, in a, in a really good way and that's the problem we start to see in these kind of microservice architectures with choreography so um, from my perspective I think it's it's a lot about finding a balance between these or choreographed approaches, which are there for a reason. I mean, you want to want to loosely couple your services. Um, you want to have the teams as autonomous as possible to just redeploy changes whenever they want to. Um, and you probably want to have event-driven event collaboration. That's a good thing, actually, for some use cases. But sometimes you also have to look into um, the other end of the story. How do I understand the end-to-end -end flow? How um, do I make sure to meet like, like SLAs? If Salando doesn't ship the order within, for example, 24 hours, they want to understand that. They want to see that. They want to understand why it's not shipped within that time. And there's not a single service which is normally responsible for that. And obviously, only if you understand the flow, you can also improve it. That's kind of a no thing. So um, personally, I'm, I'm, I'm totally biased. I, I, I totally, um, uh, we can agree on that. But I believe that 
um, like orchestration, and that's normally something you do with workflow automation technology, is really an essential building block in these kind of architectures. Um, and to give you my bias, or at least to, to make you aware of my personal bias, I'm um, co-founder and developer advocate of Camunda, so the, the beautiful company that's hosting that event here today. Um, we're headquartered exactly here, so that's, um, that's easy to, to get. Um, we're roughly 100 people at the moment, um, and we're also pretty active in the US. That's probably also interesting. If you have any questions, if you uh, want to tweet me, if you want to tweet about um, this evening, there's my Twitter handle. Um, just go ahead. In my professional life, I'm doing quite a mixture. So I'm I'm doing this kind of talks. I'm writing articles. I'm writing blog posts. But I'm also doing kind of a um, solution architecture. So I'm still really going to the customers, going to the clients, understand what they need and what they do with the technology. So that's and I'm still love coding. So I I try to to level that up. Okay, that's that's me and that's my bias. Obviously, I do workflow automation technologies since roughly 15 years. So I'm thinking from the perspective of workflow automation from state machines. That's probably good to have in mind when I'm talking about that. And today I want to make a couple of examples because I always love diving into code examples. And today I will use CB, CB.io. That's an open source project um, and we do. Um, you can just look it up, can just play around with it. It's um, basically a patch license, so it's relatively easy to use. And we're in a tech preview there, so it's not like a production stable release yet. Um, but we're working on that. And why I chose CB for, for some of the things I show you, I um, explain later on, actually. And then if you have this kind of workflow technology, and you have probably that um, choreographed um, uh, solution already in place, um, what we see is that customers are um, basically, yeah, you, the marketing term, embark on that journey um, of leveraging workflow automation. So. The easiest thing to do is actually to track the flow, to just track all the events that are basically flowing through Kafka in order to understand what's going on. I will do that um, in a minute to give you an impression of how that works. But then normally um, what most of the customers are doing, they're, they're moving also towards more managing, more orchestrating of the flow. And I will show you that in a minute as well. Okay, so that's um, basically what I want to do today. I will start on the left and then move um, slowly to the right. Normally, it's not like a like a linear thing. Normally, people are just um, doing a couple of experiments here and there. Okay, so let's do that. So let's um, go back to the example. Um, what I will do in a demo in a minute is I will um, I have Kafka running. I have the services running. Um, I will attach a workflow engine to that. In this case, the what I told earlier, CB, and then I will deploy a workflow model a state machine model to CB. Um, in this case, I'm using BPMN. Does anybody know BPMN by any chance? A couple of people, okay. That's, a, that's an ISO standard to a language to express these models. Um, so that's why it's probably interesting. So we leverage that. I can express the model and say, okay, there should be a certain events which happen in order. And then I um, start instances tracking that. And the cool part about that is as soon as you have that, you have it in the workflow engine, and that gives you a couple of uh, capabilities you didn't have before. The first is um, you could leverage other tools which make like sense of the data, for example. So we have other tools in the stack for us. Um, it means like, for example, it's called Kamuna Optimize. There you can do a lot of like auditing on the data. You can analyze the data. You can understand what's actually really going on in the flow where you have bottlenecks and these kind of things. Um, and we just do that by, by pulling out of the, all the data out of the workflow engine. So that's easy to do as soon as you have the workflow engine. But that's one part of the story. The cool part about that is it's totally um, non-invasive. So we, we, we set that up with customers where they have the choreography going on without changing anything. We just attach and then we start reading. That's very easy to do on top. But as soon as you have that, you can also start um, adding like active things. So as soon as I have that flow where I say I want to have the three events in a row, for example, then I can add what's so-called in a BPM and a timer, which keeps track of the SLA, for example, and says that basically reads like if this here is not finished within 14 days, I do something additional, like an escalation, but I keep waiting. And if, if it's even longer, I probably cancel everything, right? And this is now um, 
really easy to do because you have the state machine. The state machine is persistent. It keeps track of what's going on and it, it has a notion of time. And that's really easy to do. And that's actually pretty hard in the choreographed approach because you have um, no idea where you really can put that 21 days. Like, like which service is it? So that's relatively hard to do. But let's look how that, how that goes. I, I, I love to do live codings actually. Um, um, you have the GitHub link over there, so don't worry, we, ah, I forgot that actually. Um, we will put all the slides up in the meeting group afterwards, so don't worry. You will get the slides on SlideShare or something like that. Um, and then you will also get the link to, um, to GitHub. So all the code I show you is on GitHub. And what I have is, um, I do everything today on, on Kubernetes, like on the, on the Google Cloud, um, just for the sake of simplicity and I think it's also kind of cooler than doing it on the laptop. And um, you could do the same thing locally. Then I have Kafka running. I have these services, in this case, on Spring Boot, Java. So they're implemented in Java. I'm using something called Spring Cloud Streams in order to communicate with Kafka. I show a bit of code there in a minute, and you will see that it's really easy, like, like very, very little code you need in order to get it going. But conceptually, you could do it in any language. Right? It doesn't matter. Right. And then um, I have CD, and then I uh, wrote a small Kafka connector with Kafka Connect. Who knows Kafka Connect? A couple of people. I was surprised that not many um, actually knew it at Kafka Summit. So Kafka Connect is kind of a, um, a framework where you can have connectors and then like, like whatever, reading every row from a JDBC database and feeding that into Kafka, or getting every event from Kafka, feeding that into whatever, MongoDB or something like that. And I wrote a Kafka connector where you can read every event from a certain topic, I'll show that in a minute, um, and push that towards the workflow engine. And that's relatively easy to do. Um, oh, sorry. So let's go, let's get going. Um, so what I have is I have Kubernetes. So I have everything on the Google Cloud. What I already prepared are actually um, the services or the components you had on the slide earlier on. So I have Kafka running and Soupkeeper, obviously. I need Soupkeeper for Kafka. Um, I have my checkout component to place an order. I have a monitor where you can see all the events flowing through Kafka. I'll show that in a second. I have these, um, I call them the Pogo services. You remember, right? So the choreography um, thingy. Um, and I have CV already prepared that it's running. So that's it. It's relatively easy. I have Helm charts for everybody who wants to play around with, with that at home. So that's it. Um, when, I, when I go to that, and this is a simple choreography, so I don't dive into the code. Um, what I can do is I can actually open up the um, monitor component, and the monitor component can just track all the events on Kafka. So that's that we can see something. And the next thing is actually, um, that's my UI. That's my checkout component. You probably recognize I'm a UI guy. Um, I love that UI. Mm. It took me a while. Um, now the idea, the business idea is, um, do you know Amazon Dash button? Like you can press the Dash button, like next to whatever the washing powder is empty, I press the Dash button and then one packet of um, washing powder is ordered at Amazon. So that's the idea here. So what I can do is I can just click so, and now I placed an order. Um, what happened in the background is actually um, that there should be some events flowing through the system. So we probably do it again, um, like one time. And you see that there are events flowing through the system. You can even like look into um, uh, the payload if you like. So um, that's what you can see. And you, you see that the checkout service placed an order placed event, and that was picked up by the payment um, service um, that did something, and emitted a payment received event. So that's exactly what we had on the slides earlier on, right? So this is this is it. Um, you can do a lot of interesting discussions there, for example, for data flow, so I don't go into that, but just as a side remark if you want to dive deeper into it. So that's that's it. Um, the next thing I do, um, I actually want to um, hook up CB, and what I can do is I can deploy a workflow model. Let's do that. Uh, da -da -da -da. So there's an order tracking model. Um, that was probably the wrong model, yeah, but it doesn't matter. Um, so that's the thing you had on the slides earlier. Right? Um, I show you something how we configured it in a minute. I just deploy that to the um, workflow engine. Now the workflow engine um, actually knows the model. And the next thing I want to do is, um, let's go there. Yeah, the next 
thing. Is that readable in the back? Yeah, cool. Um, the next thing I do is I want to actually deploy the Kafka Connect thing to Kubernetes. And therefore, I use a, a, a Docker image here, and the Docker the image is defined further up. And it's actually really easy. What I use is um, I use the official Kafka um, Docker image, and then I basically add properties for the Kafka connector. You don't have to understand all the details, it's, but what you can see is that it's really easy. And I basically add, um, always mix it up, right. And I basically add this properties file, which uses um, my own little Kafka connector. Um, and then I basically tell him to listen to all the events on the flowing retail topic and talk to the broker at this address. So that's my workflow um, um, engine, my workflow broker. And then I basically um, say, okay, and then look into the payload. I use JSON here. If you wanna use Avro, that's also fine. Then you have to extend the connector a bit. But I use JSON, I look into the JSON, look into the trace ID. And the trace ID is um, what you also saw here. So I'm having a trace ID in every message so I can correlate them to one instance. And I also use that trace ID to find the right like running workflow instance later on. And I um, read the so-called message type. And uh, now we quickly have to look into um, that code if you're still with me. Uh, hang on a second, almost there, there it is. Because I have the wrong, no. Yeah, there, there it was. <laughs> No, don't want to talk with Cortana now. <coughs> so there we go. Um, the payment received event here, for example, I'm not sure if you can read that, um, but it has a message name configured, which is called message received event, right? And that's exactly the, um, the event name, which is given here. And that's what I um, basically just correlate to um, with this line. So that's basically it, right? I don't need much more in order to get it going. The only thing I have to do is I actually have to install it. Let's install it. Uh, we need the tracking. So I use Helm to install it. I could have started that before I was talking, but anyhow, um, doesn't matter. We use this Kubernetes just to fill the time gap. A couple of people, who knows Helm from me? Same people, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so what it does, it deploys that thing into Kubernetes. Um, I have it here. And it takes a bit to come up, actually. So um, what you see is that it now started the tracking. And the tracking now, um, basically, as soon as the connector is up, let's see if that's already the case here, yeah, it starts um, like workflow instance. It re reads back the log and starts workflow instances. So the next order I have will immediately um, also be fed into the workflow engine and will be visible here. And whenever, whatever, you, you shut down the shipment service, you see that it's waiting here. If you add timeouts, they will work, <coughs> right? So that's already like the first step. And that's really easy to do. Make sense so far? Awesome, um, good. So let's quickly switch back to slides. So that's what we just saw, like in real life. And then the next question, question is, okay, if I have, for example, these timeouts, if I start doing this stuff, you already made the first step towards orchestration. And the thing is, um, it makes a lot of sense, actually, to move to orchestration for some use cases, not for all of them. So, for example, the um, order placed event, that makes a lot of sense, for example, to have event um, notification because order placed is probably good to just tell it to the world. But others not, and I'll make an example. Let's assume, for that flow, like paying the item, fetching the item, shipping the item, you probably want to just change the sequence of things. Just imagine you want to fetch the item before you collect the payment because you want to be faster in shipping things, for example. And you can make a lot of examples, actually, um, where you probably want to change the sequence. If you want to do this in a choreographed world, what you have to do is you have to adjust all the three services down here. I just do it again. I like that effect, actually. You see it. Like the, um, the target of the arrow, that's your coupling. You listen to a certain event, so that's the coupling. And that means if you want to do that change, you have to change all three services down there. And that's actually pretty bad 
in a microservice world. So the idea for microservices, I always use um, this slide for microservices. Um, so this is a three-legged race, it's called. So two people are bound together by their feet and then they run. It's kind of a game, right? But what you can easily see is that they are running slower than they would if they can run alone. That's relatively obvious. And also you can see probably here or the, over there, the risk of falling down is much higher. And we're doing a lot of three-leg traces in, in, in companies. If we do like a joint deployment of two teams, that's a three-leg trace. If, and, and normally what I know from most companies, not only two teams, a lot more. And that's what we want to break up with microservices. We want to make it possible that every team runs alone, every, every guy there or every, every uh, guy or pal. And that's a three-leg trace. It's even like a more-leg trace, right? Because you have to, to have to coordinate that deployment. You even have to think about currently ongoing orders, which are currently flowing somewhere there. Like it's a versioning problem. That's really hard to solve. So that's exactly what we don't want to have like in, 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 in microservice architectures. And that's why I think in this case, it's very obvious that we need kind of an orchestration capability. And if you think of a company like Salando, for example, it would be relatively strange if they don't have an order capability. I mean, order fulfillment is what's why they are there. Um, so it makes sense that they probably have an order service and that orchestrates a couple of the others, right? It probably here, you could still have the event notification like, oh, there was an order placed. Now I have to coordinate a couple of things in order to fulfill the order. And the first is I tell the payment to do something for me. That's orchestration already. It's not about that I really have like a, whatever, God service here, a super monolithic workflow file which controls each and every detail of these kind of services. That's not the case, but I want to say, hey, retrieve the payment and I wait until you're done. And because this, by the way, is remoting, that's normally, if you use Kafka, it's like asynchronous, but even if you use REST as a remote channel, it might not be available when you, when you try to do it. And that makes it a distributed system. And I love that metaphor for distributed systems. So your single microservice is probably this. It's the hut where you're having heating, where it's cozy to be in there. You're programming in one language, you probably know what your threats are doing, you have transaction management, you have a lot of things under control in there, but when you open the door, you face the network, and that's that rough ocean which does a lot of like weird things. And that's why you have to take care of that, and um, yeah, the, you probably know the policies of distributed computing. Number one is that the network is reliable. The network is not reliable, definitely not. And you have to plan for these kind of things. And if you look at that example, it means, for example, if you're using Kafka here, it means that we are asynchronous, that we have to wait for the payment to be retrieved, and that might take milliseconds to seconds to minutes, or probably even hours, or if you want to clear some credit card problems here, probably in days. It depends on the use case, but it means we have to wait. And this makes this stateful, the orchestration part. It's in most cases in microservice by nature, because they are distributed systems, this gets stateful. That's what we see in a lot of architectures. And that, that's why it makes sense to use a state machine for that. And that's why we're using a lot of these workflow capabilities within the microservices normally. So we could say something like, this is the orchestration flow, send the command to retrieve payment, and then wait for it to happen. And then you could add like a time order, things like that. And if you got that, then you fetch the goods next and wait for it to happen, and so on and so forth. Now you have that sequence in one place. Um, you can observe it, you can like monitor it, you can change it at one place. That's really powerful, actually. Yeah, right, so if you want to, want to change the sequence or do it in parallel, that's like one place to do, and these kind of tools, they have versioning capabilities. I don't show that today, actually. It's not like a tool presentation, so. Um, but workflow engines, basically all the workflow engines out there, they can do versioning. They know, okay, you start at that order, in this workflow, so we keep doing the, this workflow and the other order in another one, so we do it in this. And that's hard to do in a correct configuration. So how does it look? Um, in the example, in a minute, I uh, basically I added the order service there. I still attach CB to the game. Um, I deploy that workflow um, onto CB, but the important thing, and you probably you recognize it in my code structure, the workflow, the, the file underneath, is part of the order 
service. So it's in the same GitHub, it's owned by the same people, it's normally like deployed by these kind of people. So even if I run, and I come back to central or decentral engines in a minute, even if I run like one central like CB installation here, um, it still means that the workflow model is owned by, um, by a certain like um, business team or whatever, like a microservice team. Okay. Let's do that. Same thing, everything on GitHub. So this time I still have my um, microservices in Spring Boot. I add that one in Spring Boot as well. I could have used the Kafka connector, by the way, to do what I do here, but I wanted to show you the comparison. So I show a bit of Java code. Okay, you could do it in any language, but I show Java code today. And yeah, that's it actually. That's what I wanna, wanna, wanna briefly dive into. So let's go. The first thing we do actually, is that readable in the back? More like, okay, cool. Delete our pogo stuff. You wanna get rid of the pogo. Oh, we should say, huh? it's not that easy to leave, delete already in production services, right? So you have to do it right. And I also um, delete the tracking for now because I don't need it at the moment. And the next thing I do is I copy and paste the statement I prepared um, in order to start up the orchestration services within um, Kubernetes. So what's going on there in the back is actually, um, if I go back to Kubernetes, um, what you can see is that it tiered down the, the POCO services and we now have the cool orchestration services um, which are not yet up, so it starts it up in the background, but that should be um, up there in, in a couple of seconds. Um, so long we can dive into the code. So let's briefly dive into the code. So what I have is a, is a Java project here. Um, I have, okay, that's the BPMN file. You don't want to see it in that format, I guess. Uh, blah, blah. There we are. What you can see in the back, it's just an XML file. That's probably um, good to point out. If you're using other formats, you could also do other formats, but XML is the standard, the default. And this is how the workflow looks like. And the thing is, um, when, I, when I look at how it starts, for example, I could say, I have a message listener here. Um, I'm using Spring, so there's a lot of Spring in there. The interesting part is actually this one. So this is, a, move it up. So this is the part where I say, listen to a certain stream of events from Kafka. The Kafka binding is done by Spring in the background magically, so you don't have to care about that actually. Um, and then I say, okay, I wanna have messages which have um, the message type order placed. That's what interests me here. Um, then I do a couple of like data mappings that doesn't matter too much. I probably do business logic if I like to. Um, <coughs> if you want to discuss about transactionality here, we can definitely do that later on. That's an interesting discussion. Um, but the imp more important thing is then the next thing I do here is I kick off a workflow. So I, um, in this case, I use CB. I say, okay, create a new workflow instance. This is the workflow, like order Kafka. If I go back here, that's the name <coughs> I've given it. Um, use the latest version, by the way, um, and here's the payload, um, the data, and then we send. Um, this gives back, if you're in asynchronous programming, in reactive programming, this gives back a future, um, so you don't have to wait for the call to happen, but if you want to wait for the call, you can do it, if you're into reactive stuff. Um, so that's the thing. Now the workflow instance starts. CB will take care that it advances. It will do that service task first, so it has to execute some logic. Um, in CB that works like you um, give it a type name for everybody who cannot read that, that's retrieve payment. Um, that means um, that I here, I have a retrieve payment, a piece of code, in this case also Java, but that again, it could be also some like a remote application if you like. Um, and what I do is uh, again, I go to CB, I say, hey, I'm a worker, I can do a certain task, in this case the um, retrieve payment, and whenever you have tasks to do, please call this uh, handler, which I, to make it short, I use the same class, so it basically calls that handle method that we will jump to in a minute, the one there. And then I lock it for a certain timeout, so that basically means give me like, in this case, one minute to do it. If I don't call you back within one minute, you can consider that I died, and then you can distribute it to another worker for resilience, for example. And then I open that subscription. And then whenever I have a new task, this code here is called, again, I go to a couple of data um, transformation things. Then I create a correlation ID for the call to the payment. 
that's an interesting part actually. I generate a correlation ID just for that single call, which is interesting for um, idempotency things, but I don't go into details. And then I use Spring again to send a message, in this case, um, a command, retrieve payment for me, please. Um, and then I attach a couple of data, like the trace ID or some other stuff, right? Um, and then I d basically say, okay, I'm done. I'm done. I sent that message. So this is then the workflow engine knows to move on. And the next thing it does, it waits for the payment received event. And that's the same thing like we already saw. So there's a message listener on the payment received. There it is. Um, and that basically means I take the message and I hand over the message to CB. And that's relatively generic code. That's why I can also do that in a CB Connect if I like to, uh, in a Kafka Connect. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. That should have given him enough time to start up. <coughs> there we are. And the thing is, I would go back to the, um, uh, to the event monitor. The behavior changes a bit. So whenever I enter a new order, the first one normally takes a bit because it warms up. The next one should be fast. Bit. It's cloud anyway. I mean. <laughs> In, in the last talk I gave, I uh, did say something like, uh, OK, Google, do it faster. And that was actually a bad idea to do, because OK, Google, you shouldn't say in talks. Um, OK, but we see what happens here. So order placed. And the next thing that happened is that um, the order microservice picked that up and sends out a command to retrieve payment. And also, again, if you're into data flow, you can also look into the data. And you see that probably you have much less data flowing around, because that's very um, yeah, nailed to the use case here. And the next thing that happened, oh, there was a payment received, and then you go on, fetch goods, and so on and so forth. Um, you can see the same thing here in the workflow engine. So if you look into workflow engine, in this case, we are, in this case, we are having the orchestration flow, and that also moved through. Again, if I shut something down, it stops at a certain point. It can do retrying. There are a lot of things you can do on top. Um, but that's basically the idea um, of how you can move into orchestration. Does that make sense? Very good. Awesome. Um, cool. What I used here is BPM and a couple of people showed hands. So I'm personally uh, totally a fan of BPM. Mm. I mentioned that early on, it's an ISO standard, so it's nothing proprietary. There are a couple of tools out there implementing BPM. Um, there's a good book on it. We wrote that, but um, it's actually the other way around. I'm, I'm, I'm not because I wrote the book, I now have to be a fan of BPMN. No, we wrote the book of, and I, because I'm really convinced BPMN is a really good language. And I make an example. So for example, um, if you're into, who knows the enterprise integration patterns? Okay, not that much people, okay. There's, it's an awesome book still. It's 10 years old, I think, or older, but it's really good. Um, written by Craig or Hopi, Enterprise Integration Patterns. And it goes into these patterns you normally have if you integrate different um, services in an enterprise. And one could be if you use messaging, probably not so much in Kafka because you have orders of events. But if you're using Rabbit or other things, you have, um, oh no, sorry, the resequencer. I do that first because that's what you, in Kafka is not such a big problem, but in a lot of messaging system, you can have out of order events or messages, so you want to resequence them. Or you want to wait, like you had a message, and then you have to wait for a couple of additional messages in order to do something <coughs> useful. And then you have to wait for these messages to come. That's stateful. You have to wait for a certain time. You want to add timeouts. If that message doesn't come within a certain time frame, you want to do something. And that's where, where BPMN is really good at. Or um, my personal favorite topic, actually, I don't dive into that today. I have an own talk on um, basically consistency. I called it lost in transactions. So if you fancy that, it's on YouTube. Um, but there I talk about these. How can you do consistency when you don't have asset transactions? So if I have three services in a row, like um, in this case, I deduct some money from a customer credit account, and then I charge his credit card. Um, I cannot make a real asset transaction. So I cannot say just like begin transaction and in case of failure, roll back. That doesn't work. Technically, it doesn't work. Kafka cannot do any any um, real um, transactions there. So um, what I do is actually I split it up. I have one transaction like deducting the customer credit. Then it's done. And if I have a problem when I charge the credit card, I undo the first thing. It's not a rollback. It's a semantical undo. But then I have to define how I do that, and that's basically another activity that I might call 
service, send out a message or whatever it's technically. But you have to take care of that. And again, it's stateful because you never know when you're ending up here and you never know if in the moment you want to compensate if this service is available. So, and this is what B B B B BPMN can do out of the box. And that's really, really um, cool actually. And the, I mean, one of the most powerful things, I haven't shown that in detail, but um, independent of the tools, some are better, some are not so good, but all of them have some kind of visibility for um, what's the obvious thing, like BIS devs, you probably want to discuss these kind of flows. And a lot of these problems you have, I mean, these architectures are probably starting with technical problems. What happens if I don't get a response message in a certain time frame? It's kind of a technical thing because it can happen in an asynchronous um, distributed system, but the reaction is normally a business question. What should we do? How long should we wait? What happens if we don't get it? Is, can we ignore it? Should we redo it? Should we do some remedy? Whatever. That's a business thing. So you have to discuss about that. And this is where um, the visual helps. The next thing is like, and that's for, from my perspective, even sometimes the more important, like DevOps. So you really have something for operations. You see how, how much instances, for, for example, are currently waiting, how much are failed. If they are failed, you can dive into the the um, problem description, all the context, where did they come from, what, what did happen, the payload, and you probably can fix that. So um, that's an operational thing. And you get a lot of these audit data for free, so you can um, basically analyze what's really going on. And that's really powerful, actually. That's what you totally miss out in choreography normally. And then when we are looking at um, customer scenarios, normally what they do is kind of a mixture, actually. So we have... Um, Customers using Kafka and then doing pubs up on Kafka for, for services. Probably also services using like, like Kamunda or, or CB. Um, and then we have other services probably called directly via REST still. I mean, 80% of the people, I, uh, survey was close to 80% of the people using REST. And that's also my observation throughout the customer base. So most of the people still do REST. So you probably still do that some parts. Or um, you can directly pops up to, to a workflow engine as well. So um, it's totally valid to mix that up in your architecture. One important thing um, is when I, when I propose that, very often the discussion comes up like, um, is workflow orchestration, that's the central thing, right? There's the central orchestrator. I don't want to have that central orchestrator. And orchestration is nothing central. That's very important for me um, because I do discuss that so often. So in this case, I have an orchestration flow within order, but it's ownership of the order. It's totally disconnected in this case from the payment, for example. The payment might have its own flow. They might use different tools, like different implementation approaches. It's Microsoft, that's fine. The important thing is the API between them. But if you have a problem within one service where you need like a stateful orchestration, then I think you should definitely go for, for, for a tool that supports that. But that's, again, probably my bias. Um, and then you can run, and that's a, that's a different, actually, um, so this is always true. So you have to have that ownership and that, like, distribution of the different parts of the workflow to different teams. Um, but you still can, if you like, for sometimes technically, uh, architecture-wise, it's, it's, it makes sense to run it centrally. If you want to do that, do that, and then you can run like a central engine, like, for example, CV in this case, and deploy other workflows to there, even if they are owned by different people or different teams, that's technically possible. Almost. I had the introduction, so I have like three more minutes, I think. I hope. I need three more minutes, at least. Um, or you can do it decentrally. I mean, if you want to have a decentral engine, um, that's also fine. Um, so you can run, like, every service can run its own engine. And then it can even, like, technology-wise, very different, different tools. <coughs> the next thing I normally discuss, um, Okay, you propose to have that like tracking, but we're doing use cases with uh, whatever, 15K messages per second or something like that, like high throughput. Isn't workflow this human task thing where you do like 10 tasks a minute or something like that? That's what most people think of workflow automation, which is actually not true. true. With, our, with the um, engine which we have in our current product out there, a lot of customers also at Salando, they're doing relatively high volumes. That's possible technically. But there is in the current technology, like the engine we have there, Kamunda BPM, it, it uses a relational database, which is a, the limit of scalability. It's, it gets quite far, but there is a limit. And that's what we currently teach 
um, workflow engines to do like really high throughput, low latency use cases. Like, and that's why I use CB today. And CB is exactly that, where we teach it to be here. And there we have discussed use cases where we're really going into 100,000 like instances per second. We have, I think I have the slide here, yeah. Um, we did measures where we are roughly at the same rate of speed like Kafka like writing events per second. That makes it possible to take every event from Kafka and just put it into the workflow engine. Technically, that's possible. That's pretty cool, actually. And here we did experience with scaling, and that's um, like we can easily run like a one million <coughs> workflow instances per second. And that's kind of a really linear scale, so we can just keep adding um, nodes to it, and then it gets faster. And that's pretty cool, actually. Um, I skip that for a second. Um, no, not yet. <laughs> um, that's the last slide. So, so going over that, like the summary is, okay, um, event-driven systems are great. They're a good use case for event-driven. So I don't want to say event-driven is crap. That's totally not what I want to say. But there are use cases um, where you shouldn't use that, especially if you have like flows crossing multiple services. And if, there's, if they're getting more complex, you lose sight, and that will be a big deal. I saw a lot of customers where this is a big deal. So visibility is really the most important thing to survive there. So tracking might be a good start. But I think in the long run, you should balance orchestration and choreography. And that's what most projects don't do. So they, most projects are either like still very much orchestration, like the SOA and BPM curve was like totally orchestration. So that's why most people said, okay, this doesn't work, so we are moving completely to choreography. That doesn't work either. So you have to balance it. Um, and then you need stateful orchestration because we're in distributed systems. And everything might take longer as expected. Um, and then you either track, but you probably also want to manage the flow. And workflow automation is important to do that. And if you do workflow automation, um, even if you don't use our tools, that's fine. Um, but I would really recommend to use BPMN. I think the language is really powerful. So if you look at, for example, some cloud vendors, they also do these kind of workflow engines like AWS, Step Functions, or Azure um, Durable Functions, or Google Cloud Composers. They all invent their own new language, and you can already foresee the problems they will run into. So um, I definitely love the language, so that's what I would opt for. So that's basically all I have. Just uh, overrun by two minutes, I think that's fine if we pay for the beers and the, the food. Um, so here are all the contact details. So again, the every, everything from the code is on GitHub. Um, all the, no, I didn't rec recommend any blog posts, but um, I will pull up the slides over there. Um, so if that was interesting, um, just check it out. Um, thank you very much. I hope that was enjoyable. We do a Q&A later on, so I will directly pass on to you. Thank you.